Hello and a warm welcome to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. It is not an exaggeration to say that Russian President Vladimir Putin is the most recognizable leader in the world today. He's also regularly demonized in the West. What is it about Putin that captures the imagination of so many? To discuss this and more, I'm joined in London with Alexander McCurris. He's a writer on legal affairs and an analyst. We also have David Coburn. He's the UKIP member of European Parliament for Scotland. We also have Frank Ferretti. He is an author and emeritus professor of sociology at the University of Kent. And here in Moscow with me is Andrew Kripko. He is an analyst and writer. Uh, Alexander McCurris, we talked not too long ago about the person of Vladimir Putin. That means like a day ago. What is it, you know, in a nutshell that captivates so many people, his, his uh, admirers and his detractors? First of all, he's a very forthright man and a very uh, strong politician. I don't think there's anybody in the world who would actually challenge that. Secondly, um, as I've said before, he is the president of a very powerful country. And um, what he says is what Russia says. And because it is such a powerful country and because he says it in such a forthright way, people notice Third, a lot of what he says is what people around the world are, are, are interested in. He, he is somebody who will say no, for example, over Syria. He, he, he also has his own ideas, which are, of course, the ideas that Russia has. And they are not always the ideas that some people in Washington and London and Paris and Berlin and Brussels want to hear. So for all of these different reasons, he is somebody that people notice and pay a great deal of attention to. Okay, I want to unpack quite a few of those comments uh, a little bit later in the program. Frank, if I can go to you, let's turn it all upside down. It's not that because it's not because uh, Putin is such a, a wonderful statesperson or intellect or personality or celebrity, all those words. It's because in the world today, particularly in the West, you could say that there's a lot of political pygmies. There's literally very few people of substance. Well, it is true that in the land of the uh, blind, the one-eyed man is king. And I think that the very fact that he seems to have convictions and he mm. seems to mean what he say uh, does mark him out from the very pragmatic public relations, short-term oriented image that uh, Western politicians communicate. And I think it, it, it's something that actually disturbs sections of the Western media who almost mm. tend to believe that any politicians who's got strong views and strong sentiments is a something of a fundamentalist, some, somebody who cannot be trusted, somebody who uh, is, is on the wrong side of the culture wars. And I think one of the reasons why there's this obsession with him and, and the tendency to pathologize him is precisely because his image is in almost a moral contrast to what is acceptable to these people in the media itself. I think that it's the whole cultural uh, war's perceptions that makes him so popular in Russia because so many Russians reject this postmodernist agenda that is coming out of the West and, and, and very specifically in the European Union. This is one of the reasons why people in Russia and around Russia really admire Vladimir Putin because he doesn't follow that agenda. I would agree with that. I think the problem with um, uh, Vladimir, uh, the problem with the European Union, uh, as uh, has been previously said, is a bunch of uh, political pygmies. Mm. And the United States, likewise, has got a political pygmy running, running the states. I think the problem is that Vladimir Putin knows what he's doing. He has direction. He's giving Russia what it needs, a strong man with a, with a view. And uh, people in Russia like it. And I think a lot of people are in Europe who see our political leaders as, as a lot of mush. I quite frankly admire the man. Andrew, can you comment on anything we've heard here so far? Yeah, there is a lot that I'd like to comment on, but just to keep it brief, uh, I'd like to reference Patrick Buchanan, who in the past has said that in the future, we might be seeing uh, the world being divided between conservative leaders and liberals. And we see what's happening with the EU. The EU is very, very liberal, which is the opposite of the vast majority of Russian society. For example, in Russia, um, you know, the state the state supports the uh, outpouring of religious sentiment, whereas in the EU, there's a lot of, one may even say, there's almost like religion is being... Is not seen as a positive thing sometimes. So in some ways, Putin can resonate with that base, which is very, very important. And another thing too is that uh, we look at Russia's reaction towards Pussy Riot, for example. Well, you just I'm just going to say Pussy yeah. Riot, and I, I don't know what the woman's name is with the beard. Um, oh yeah, I don't. Okay. That, that but that, but, <laughs> but that you know, Alex, Alexander, if I can go to you, yeah. I mean, this, this is exactly because I, I think it, I want to talk about foreign policy in a mm -hmm. few minutes, obviously. But I mean, from a cultural point of view, I think this is what's so missed in uh, in Western media mm -hmm. because. Um, there is a growing sense of religiosity and, and, and spirituality in Russia as a mm. result of the re return of the church 
um, after mm. the Soviet disaster for them, and uh, so many other things, and just identity, and their identity is not this bearded woman, if I can use that example <laughs> well, again. <laughs> well, exactly. Of course, you see, the Russians are to a very great extent reacting against a lot of this thing that happened within Soviet society. And, of course, the problem is that um, um, it, it goes completely against an awful lot of what is the West's own liberal zeitgeist at the moment. They look at all of this, and they don't like it at all because it is what they are opposed to within their own societies. So they project their own culture wars on Russia and on the person of Vladimir Putin, who is, of course, uh, the embodiment of this new mm. masculine, conservative uh, um, image that, that, that they simply don't like. And, of course, what also happens, and it's very interesting, is that you see conservative people in the West like Patrick Buchanan um, is one example, but, but also in many other places, are actually strangely attracted back to what they see as the reverse culture wars that are happening in Russia. So it's all very interesting. But, of course, from the point of view of the political liberal establishment in the West, this is all very um, terrible, and uh, they don't like it. They're very uncomfortable with it. They're very uncomfortable with a political leader who looks strong and virile, and, of course, they themselves don't. And, of course, they try not to be. That is what they're actually rejecting. <laughs> Yeah, they, and they have a hard time understanding that uh, uh, yeah. Vladimir Putin is very, very popular among Russians and Russian voters. You know, one of the interesting things, if I can go to Frank, one of the things that I find very worrying, because I've been following um, um, Vladimir Putin in high politics since uh, he became acting uh, prime minister, then prime minister, and then acting president, and then president. And one of the interesting things is that it, the way he is treated and, and referred to in Western media and Western capitals, this man could stay in power for another decade. So, I mean, how much further can the demonization go? Well, I think there's a, a very real problem because in the West there is a, a media reality which uh, influences a, a certain section of public opinion and it's particularly influential amongst the political class, which has a, an image of uh, Putin that's very pathologized that... Uh, regards him as this uh, personification of evil and it, it's got a very unrestrained uh, kind of cultural dynamic behind it where literally uh, anything that strikes one as evil can be attached to him but that kind of image is is really confined to a, a particular section of of of, uh, of society and i think alongside of that there is a realization that uh, at the end of the day russia isn't Libya, isn't uh, a small, insignificant mm. state that can be marginalized and ignored, uh, that you have to do business with it. And so therefore, alongside of it, there is a, a grudging uh, behind the scenes uh, understanding that what you've got here is somebody who you can do business with, who uh, is relatively s a stable character that's got a s solid base of support. And I think we've got this uh, political schizophrenia at the moment. Mm. Uh, which is particularly mm -hmm. powerful um, in in the EU, but where within the EU uh, it's it, that you're getting differential reactions. But I've been to Italy recently, and I was really struck by the way in which Italian politicians and intellectuals have an attitude towards Russia that's strikingly different to yeah. that of England, and where Putin is seen as a a normal statesman rather than a, a, a an authoritarian denim. So. There is a kind of heterogeneous reaction that's potentially there, and I think that's going to uh, sort of crystallize into a more nuanced relationship with Putin in the years ahead. David, we heard Frank used the word uh, doing business with, but we're, we're not doing a whole lot of business right now with these uh, sanction wars going on. It's really quite interesting is that uh, th it, appears, it appears that the, the West was taken off guard when Russia reacted from sanctions from the West and imposed its own sanctions. And this is, again, something that the West isn't used to having happen, that another country uh, sanctions them. Well, quite right. The, the, the Russians, uh, we had the European Union had no business interfering in the Ukraine. It's absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with with the European Union. Um, you know, it was everybody understood what the demarcations were after the Cold War. Um, the Ukraine is most decidedly within Russian sphere of, sphere of influence. The EU are doing a little bit of empire building as per usual, but they've come up against somebody that's uh, 
that's not mushy, <laughs> that's how should we put it, somebody mm. who's pretty strong and is not going to put up with it. And quite frankly, they nearly started a war. And you've got people like Baroness Ashton, who quite frankly, the only reason she's there is because sort of friends of the, of, uh, of the Blairs and such like. Um, you know, she has no proper record as a foreign minister. She doesn't know what she's doing, quite frankly. And she's mm. trying to, you know, she, you know, this woman could, you know, could start a war. And quite frankly, you should leave the Ukraine alone, uh, right along the line from, from you know, the Ukraine right up to, to the Baltic. You know, people are being made feel nervous. You know, mm-hmm. why, why should we be creating fuss in, in a country where we, we quite frankly don't have money to rebuild it? I mean, German taxpayers and British taxpayers, who quite frankly are the only people who pay any money into the EU, are not wanting to rebuild the Ukraine. Quite frankly, it's mm-hmm. not something that we want to do. The, and the European Union can't even sort out uh, Spain, it can't even sort out Greece, it can't sort out Italy. Mm. Why there should be empire building in a country which is, you know, needs complete reconstruction, I can't understand. You're listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Uh, Andrew, if I can go to you here in Moscow with me. Everything that we've kind of heard so far, it seems to me that, you know, one of the reasons why Putin is demonized in Western capitals because he actually has an idea what he's doing. Yeah. Because he, I, I keep saying <laughs> these Victoria Newlands and Ashtons and, and Camerons and, and you know, I'm, I've always been a bit soft spot for Merkel, uh, not so much <laughs> recently, but, you know, it seems that, you know, that none of them are on the same page, number one, mm. and none of them are very decisive. And because when looking at this, you Ukraine crisis. I wrote a few months ago is that Russia has a contingency plan for almost everything that's happening and we don't see any kind of thought out idea about what to do with Ukraine now since they broke it. I would definitely agree with that characterization in a way with these other uh, foreign policy individuals you mentioned, Newland and whatnot and Ashton. They're kind of like chickens running around with their head chopped off and Putin is the only rooster in the hen house. He's the only one that really knows what's going on and another thing is too is he there's a saying that I've heard, uh, either you stand for something or you'll fall for anything. And these leaders in the West are falling for anything, whereas Putin, he's always very consistent with his foreign policy, with representing Russia, and with what he thinks what he thinks the world should look like, and that's precisely multipolarity. And when you have countries or entities like the EU that are trying to live in an anachronistic era of unipolarity and Western dominance, whereas you see all the trends are, are looking the opposite way, I mean, the center of global gravity is going to be in the East, not in the West, you see that Putin is actually ahead of the game, whereas the others, they're trying to turn back the page on a book when... It, in a way, we see these desperate actions such as trying to tear apart Ukraine in order to pursue this unipolar dream that it's easily fading. Alexander, you know, let's remind our listeners the the attitude that you can find in Western capitals and, and, and corporate media about mm-hmm. uh, Putin is quite obvious to all of us on this recording. But um, it wasn't always that way. What was it like in the very beginning when Putin came to power? There was huge relief to have a strong and effective leader in Russia who was not Mr. Yeltsin, basically, and uh, who was also not a communist, because, of course, there was always that fear that the communists were going to come back. And that was very strong in the 90s. It's difficult to remember that now. And he was widely assumed to be a somebody that the West could work with and who would keep going what happened in the 1990s which the West liked whilst at the same time doing it rather more efficiently and then what began to go wrong and it began to go wrong very early was that it became quite clear that Mr Putin is actually not somebody who is going to run the place more efficiently put in the way the West wants but somebody who is going to run the place more efficiently in the way that Russians wanted and that of course explains his popularity but it, in Russia, but it also explains his unpopularity in the West. And uh, we were talking about this recently. It really be, all began with Yukos when mm. uh, Mr. Putin turned on uh, uh, Khodorkovsky and on the oligarchs, drove out Mr. Berezovsky, drove out Mr. Kuzinsky, and um, that brought home to people in the West that actually Russia was uh, back, uh, the Russian state was being restored, and it was happening in a way they didn't like at all. In the one way they didn't like it, it's what it reminded our listeners is that the West didn't get Yukos, they didn't get the largest exactly. uh, oil producer, and this because it was a plan to sell it to Western oil exactly. companies, and this is what is the straw that broke exactly. the camel's back uh, exactly. here in Moscow. Exactly. Frank, one of the things in, in, in looking at the the image of of Putin in in Russia, the way it's portrayed, is that it's almost kind of the negative self of the West. Everything that is bad that you can see in yourself is being projected somewhere else because uh, I don't want to get over overly ideological on this program but I don't see Russia as an aggressive country I don't see it as an expansionist country it's actually very much a status quo country 
but it's portrayed in a completely opposite fashion in Western media when indeed, and we can go through the name all of the wars in the last 10 years, where the West has been extremely aggressive in the world. Well, I think that's right. There is a, a strong sense in which Russia is a status quo power, um, and I think that's broadly recognized by most people who are doing work on geopolitical issues. But I think what has happened is that uh, as a result of a number of uh, developments, Western culture has almost used Russia as a, as a focus through which it kind of relives its own fears so that uh, mm. it has become a, a kind of uh, permanent moral contrast mm. to the mm. values that it upholds. I think uh, earlier on we were discussing the issue of masculinity. I think the whole devaluation of masculinity in the West is seen as being um, directly opposed by this very masculine political leader who takes off his shirt and rips his muscles in public and has a very different attitude towards being a man than is acceptable in Islington in London or in uh, Manhattan. Mm. And I think that's something that <laughs> a lot of people find similarly with religion, similarly with traditional family life, similarly with kind of broader global issues. There's a, a different language, a, a different cultural mm. narrative that's being spoken in Russia, which uh, in a sense uh, serves as a as a reminder of, uh, of of what a different way of life is like to the West, Western Western mm. kind of cultural elites, and therefore becomes uh, almost like an incitement to uh, to react. There's one point I like to make, which is it's very easy after the event team to kind of believe that Western the West, Western cultural war against Russia has been carefully planned or it's it's kind of orchestrated behind the scenes. I think a lot of it is just a, a kind of sleepwalking element where, you know, mm. they react, they, they kind of poke away at Putin, they poke away at Ukraine. They imagine that what they're poking away is an analogous to poking away at a government in Liberia or a, a small, relatively insignificant country. And then one morning they wake up and realize that actually they've kind of precipitated a, an incredible uh, global conflict, uh, mm. one that has got very kind of destructive consequences. So what is really dangerous from my standpoint is not that there's a plan here on the part of these people, but that but that they just somehow uh, are too immature to understand how high the stakes are in this war of words that they're directing at the Russian government. I think also David, I really that, um, yeah, go ahead, jump in. So in the, that, um, that basically in the West, uh, you know, we've lost our culture. It's all just turning into into a monoculture or whatever of, of political correctness. And I think the, the Western leaders are probably more terrified of Putin because um, there's a bit of a counter revolution going on. Uh, UK parties like UKIP um, mm. and um, other other parties uh, who are fed up with all this political correctness nonsense. Um, they probably fear that Putin's giving them some sort of lead um, and, mm. and that's what's make, unnerving them somewhat. Andrew, one of the things that a lot of people forget, and particularly Western uh, journalists here in Moscow, is that because of the events of uh, what's happening in the, the tragedy in Ukraine, um, the tragic destruction of the Malaysian airplane, which we all are still waiting for those black mm. boxes. What has that done to domestic politics here? Because we had a, an American ambassador, Michael McFall, here, you know, mm. cultivating all of his liberal friends here in Moscow, and there are quite a few. Our listeners should know that. But they've been mo marginalized now even more because of the, w the what's happened in Ukraine. Because, as I always explain to my foreign friends, is that maybe in Washington and in London and Berlin, you know, Ukraine is a kind of geopolitical idea. You know, it's a, p a place that they find on a map. But here in Russia, it's a local. It's a local issue mm. because we, we people have families mm. there, mm -hmm. and so what it really what it has done is it it has even marginalized even more the kind of liberals that the West wants to cultivate here in Russia. Yeah, and I find that to be very ironic, as the West wants to use the liberal well wanted to in the past to use liberals to try to push its agenda, but now they yeah they basically ostracize that group through their actions. I mean, in here in Russia, liberals are seen as very discredited and may I say, some people even view them as sellouts. Now, what I find interesting, if you're going to look at what's happening in Ukraine and you try to uh, juxtapose it into uh, Russia, I almost see a new, very dangerous pattern being developed right now. 
We look at how the West flirts and actually openly works with extreme nationalists in Ukraine, and this may possibly give them an opening or an idea for what to use here in Russia to try to find some type of liberal nationalist hybrid as they were trying to find an Alexei Navalny to become the new, the new, if you will, their new proxy political candidate for pushing their agenda. And unfortunately, that may have a small reaction here. That might actually be possibly more impactful than working with pure liberals, but it's actually more dangerous and more destabilizing. You're listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Alexander, if mm. I can go back to you in London, mm. looking at Ukraine again mm. and how Putin is viewed in Western media around that uh, growing and mm. intensifying tragedy, it seems to me that it's, it's cynicism of the highest degree because mm. we had Western involvement. There's a mountain of evidence that mm. the U.S. and the European Union were involved in backing the coup and, and certainly recognizing the coup in Kiev. But particularly the Americans, are there on a win-win situation because, okay, they wanted to get all of Ukraine. They didn't get it. They didn't get Crimea. Crimea. Mm-hmm. But now they can trash Ukraine. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's, there's not going to be any Ukrainian immigrants uh, flooding America's shores. No. That's for sure. And they're not going to give them visas either. No. Since they didn't succeed in their agenda in Ukraine, they found a perfect boogeyman. Vladimir Putin. It's always his fault. I've been reading very closely some of your work on the diplomatic agenda that Russia has been pushing, and it's really been the Russian side. Vladimir Putin and we have Foreign Minister Lavrov constantly pushing a diplomatic solution. We may get one. I've been reading very closely what you've been saying. Well, we might get one, but I mean, it's come after an enormous amount of devastation and misery, and of course, it's still not certain that we will, because I think one point I would make is that people have been saying that there's no plan in the West, and that is true. But there is certainly a certain vision, which is of an expanding liberalism. If we go back 15 years, the end of history rhetoric. And mm-hmm. I think an awful lot of people in the West are still trapped in that. And one of the fundamental problems is that whilst the Russians look at the world in a very realistic and hard-headed way, many people in the West, frankly, don't. They see it in a very ideological and visionary way. And we've seen this playing out in the Ukraine, where the reality of the situation on the ground and the way some people people want to perceive it in the West could scarcely be more different. I mean, it is a complete looking glass world sometimes reading what is being written about this. You can almost say that the reverse of what you read in the Western media about the Ukraine is actually the truth. And Mm -hmm. coming back to the human consequences of that, Any system that is not based on reality is going to be extraordinarily devastating to people's lives. And we have seen, and it's not just the Ukraine, a whole chain of countries, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Iraq again now, utterly devastated, and of course Ukraine. And of course the people who are responsible for these policies not only never learn anything from them, but they can always walk away and it is the people who live in those countries and those around who have to pay the price. Uh, we go ahead, jump in, go ahead. We, we need to look to Putin as an ally against the real danger at the moment, which is militant Islam. Um, this is a, a proper danger to the world, something we really do have to worry about. Um, the Ukraine is not a danger to the rest of us, but, but militant Islam is. And Mr. Mr. Putin, as, as you said earlier, has a more realistic view of how to deal with that than perhaps people in the West who are very mushy and, again, very sort of politically correct, and they've led to the society uh, where all all sort of behavior or whatever is equivalent and quite frankly their liberalism is you know they've been strangled by their own liberalism and that's that's half the problem we have no public policy on, on militant islam was mr putin is fairly hard line and such things and you know i think we need him as an ally on that we should stop worrying about the ukraine which is really nothing to do with us whatever and worry about things that we really do concern us Frank, if I can go to you, one of the interesting things is that there's an extra caveat here. I agree with you. I think foreign policy coming out of the Western capitals is very muddled. But at the same time, when I look at the political profile of people like Victoria Nuland, she really does see Russia as uh, evil incarnate. It really, if you look at her testimony in front of Congress and whatnot, it's her type of political elk that doesn't want Russia to participate in resolving conflicts in the world. When I look at, at Syria, the neocons in Washington were furious, furious that Obama agreed to a Russian plan to end uh, Syria's chemical weapons program. They were furious about it. And And then again, and Alexandra and I have been over this territory quite a few times, Mm -hmm. when Russia suggested 
uh, after uh, Yanukovych uh, walked away, didn't reject, walked away from the uh, European mm -hmm. Association Agreement. Russia said, let's have a trilateral conversation. Everybody can be a winner here. Brussels and Washington slammed the door on that. They don't want compromise. They want a unilateral outcome that pleases them because they cannot, because Russia cannot be recognized as an equal partner. I would make a distinction between Washington and Europe. I think in America, there is still a lot of influential people who are reliving the old Cold War and who yeah. see the present uh, relation between Russia and the West pretty much through the prism of what happened in the 1945 to the 1980s period. And they haven't really learned the fact that things have changed quite fundamentally. And if you listen to some of the discussions in the American Senate, it, it's got this kind of weird character where they're discussing uh, as if the world had stopped 30, 40 years ago, not realizing just how much has changed. So uh, a lot of the uh, this, this kind of uh, Russia will not pass kind of reactions are really um, characteristically American. Whereas with the EU, what you've got is not so much uh, the reliving of the Cold War, not so much uh, the old struggle being conducted in, in a new language, but a, a much more uh, a kind of confused attempt to uh, spread the influence of EU ideals give meaning to the EU because, you see, people don't really have very much faith in what the European Union is, is all about. It hasn't got very much legitimacy. And it's trying to gain a, a degree of uh, authority through some of its humanitarian initiatives, through some of its uh, foreign diplomatic uh, sort of uh, attempts to kind of become more influential. And I think that reaction is arguably where the confusions really begin to kick in because when you have humanitarianism displacing geopolitical calculations. You never know where you're going to end up. And I think uh, the earlier speaker talked about Iraq, Syria, you know, Libya, all these uh, developments. I, in many respects, I think the example of Syria is what should really worry us, because the West went into Syria not thinking about anything to do with reality, only having a fantasy of what they were doing. Uh, it, it's done the same thing in the Ukraine, and, st and it's still doing that. I think it's that fantasy-like uh, sort of uh, ideology that's that's kind of scrapped in. That's really important. And I think the ne neo neocons in, in Washington are a dying breed. They're not going to be a problem for very much longer. I mm. think it's this new, confused humanitarian impulse, uh, which is really not very humanitarian, but it's actually quite uh, predatory. Not <laughs> exactly. About. And thank you for that caveat there. And let me go to Andrew here. I mean, if we do look at Ukraine as the European Union's first really big foreign policy project, it's a, a catastrophe. Yeah, it's an absolute blunder. But I'd like to go back real quick to what the previous speaker mentioned about dividing the U.S. from the EU and this whole you know, Cold War idea versus humanitarianism. And I'd say that's exactly on point, but only for half the continent. Only when you look at Western Europe. Because if you look at Eastern Europe, you look at the political elites there, specifically in Poland, specifically in the Baltic states. With all those apples. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> well, the apple doesn't fall <laughs> far from the tree in this case. You see that they're trying to aggressively push NATO. So they're actually, in their own fashion, they're kind of also stuck in a Cold War mentality. And what mm. I find interesting is looking at the EU as this first experiment of the EU, of, I mean, looking at Ukraine as the EU's first experiment in foreign policy, you kind of see a fusion of Western Europe and Eastern Europe in the sense of ideals, quote unquote, and pushing NATO. And you see this manifest in the Eastern part Partnership. The Eastern Partnership, in my opinion, in my view, is the marriage between Eastern and Western Europe's interest, humanitarianism, quote unquote, and expanding NATO. Well, Andrew, in it's, one area. It, that's a toxic mixture. Of course, it? It, that, that's that's what we see. It's absolutely <laughs> toxic. Alexander, I want to give you the last word on the program. Go ahead. <laughs> I'd like to kind of ask the question again. Vladimir Putin could be in power for a long time to come. This demonization has to end somehow, or. Is it going to morph what? I mean, how, how much worse can you call the man? I can't see that he can be called any worse things than he already is. And I think that's going to be a major problem because, as you're absolutely right, he is the reality. And I, I think just not just Mr. Putin. I mean, we've got to understand that Russia is there. And what they don't like is, in fact, that he stands up for Russian interests. And mm. unless and until there is a recognition of that fact in the West, relations between the West and Russia are going to be extremely difficult. And if I I can just talk about Eastern Europe very quickly. Eastern Europe's situation requires it to have good relations with Russia. This constant <laughs> conflict between Eastern European elites and Russia acting out old demons from the Cold War and in Poland, actually, even before the Cold War, is 
of no use to them at all. And expanding NATO, creating uh, insecurity on every side, is actually entirely contrary to any analysis of their own national interests. So what we need to do is to look at this in a much more realistic way and start looking at the world as it is, not as some people in Washington and Brussels, and I think we should not underestimate the degree of ideological unity there between Washington and some people in Brussels anyway. We've run out of time, gentlemen. I want to thank Alexander, David, Frank, and Andrew here sitting with me here in Moscow. You've been listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Stay with Voice of Russia.